Praise the Lord. We're going to go now to Second Chronicles, chapter 14. Second Chronicles, 7:14. After the kingdom split on Solomon's death, Jeroboam seized part of the kingdom, and a man named Abijah came to reign over Judah. And just for rehashing just a bit, to go back just a bit, the kingdom split. It split into uh, into 10 and 2, the tribes, the 10 northern tribes called Israel, the 10 southern tribes called Judah. Uh, the two southern tribes were Judah and Benjamin. Judah was the largest tribe, Benjamin was the smallest. And the, of course, in the land of Judah was where Jerusalem and the temple was located. And uh, the 10 northern tribes will be called Israel from this for after the split kingdom. And they will be at war with one another, often known very seldom at peace. The southern kingdom, Judah and Benjamin, since Benjamin was such a small place and Judah was such a large one, they began to be called the Judites and eventually became called the Jews. And that's where we get the term Jews, the Judites, who were in the southern tribe which controlled the temple. Now the two southern tribes were the ones who stayed closest to the Bible as a rule, although they periodically strayed off also. The 10 northern tribes were the ones who were off into all kinds of things. They went with, uh, under Jeroboam, they built golden calves and worshiped in the groves. You find references to the groves. They had groves of trees and this is where they went and committed all kinds of sexual acts in worship of their gods. You have to realize that in heathen ceremonies, when you go into demon worship, Satan worship, witchcraft, you will end up offering sexual acts to those demon gods as acts of worship. And uh, so this is why when you find a reference to the groves, you'll find this is what they're talking about. And they had male and female prostitutes in their temples. And so when they went to a worship service, they offered sacrifices, they had a big barbecue, and they offered parts of the animal or the birds to the demon gods they were worshiping. And then they ate the rest of it in a big feast. It was meat offered to idols. You remember when, they, when Jesus came along, Paul came along, they talked about meats offered to idols. And um, this was common practice in heathen temples and they would have a drunken brawl to close it out, kind of like the wedding receptions you have in a lot of places. Uh, closed out in a, wedding, in a drunken brawl. Everybody got drunk, began to dance around, take off their clothes, and sleep around. Sounds like a modern party, and that's what it was. And God hated it then. He judged the land then. He still does today for the same sort of things. So just with that little sketchy background, that'll help you to understand where we are, where we started. And we're going back. And instead of talking about one of the rotten kings, we're going to talk about a good one. How about that? There was a good one every once in a while. And the son of Abijah did not follow in his father's footsteps, but rather he went back further and picked up a godly line. So let's look at verse 14. Abijah slept with his fathers. Uh, by the way, Jeroboam got hit in this battle. He never did recover. But Abijah uh, married 14 women, and he had 22 sons and 14 daughters. What a mess. And um, anyway, uh, Asa came out of this big mess, which goes to show that even when your daddy makes a mess, you can still do all right, which is encouraging maybe to some. So Abijah, verse 14, chapter, uh, verse 1, slept with his fathers. They buried him in the city of David. Asa, his son, reigned in his stead. In his days, the land was quiet for 10 years. It had uproar, war, and upheaval before this. Now it's 10 years of quiet. And Asa did that which was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. If you can get a leader that will do what's good and right in the sight of the Lord, it will cause a land to... Uh, yes, sir? 
I'm sorry, I'm in Second Chronicles. Did I give you the wrong one? Second Chronicles. Can't you figure out where I am, Michael? <laughs> I gave you a tiny little puzzle, whether it's First or Second Chronicles, you can't even figure it out. Second Chronicles 14.1. <clears throat> I'll talk with you later about that, Michael. <laughs> You're supposed to sit there all bug-eyed like little treeful owls over there. All right. Second Chronicles 14.1. They buried him in the city of David. Asa, his son, reigned in his stead. And in his days, the land was quiet for 10 years. Asa did that which was good and right in the sight of the Lord. My, what a relief that would be if we'd had something like that come along. Now notice what he did that was good and right. He took away the altars of the strange gods. Well, that would cause an uproar, wouldn't it? He took away the altars of the strange gods and the high places, that's where they went to do their immorality. And he broke down the images and cut down the groves. They didn't have any place to hide, no weeds to go into to do their dirty work. Uh, that was quite a step for him. I mean, he, he, he destroyed those other demonic religions. He just went in, broke up their images, tore down their buildings, cut down, I mean, he devastated the whole thing. That's one way to get people out of the, out of the house of the demons, isn't it? You just destroy them. Now, I don't know whether I'd advise that or not. I did hear of a couple of ladies one time. They happened to be black sisters, and they were Christians, and they loved the Lord. And they lived down on one side of town, and both of them were very much in love with the Lord, and they loved to visit. Well, was about a block between their houses, and right in the middle between their houses, there was a big old honky-tonk. And every night, you know what goes on in a honky-tonk, don't you? I don't know, that may date me a little bit. Saloon, that goes back even further. Dive, disco, we'll try to update it a little bit. Anything you want to call it, where it's dark, smells like a hog pen, and the people act like hogs. You know, where they drink, smoke, cuss, dance and various other unmentionable things. Well, this was going on in this building between these two ladies. Well, they were quite concerned about it. They didn't like it. And uh, they talked about it, and they decided they would pray that God would put this thing out of business because it annoyed them, it kept them up at night, the noise and all the terrible things going on, and many people were getting caught in the snare of the devil there. So they decided they covenanted together to pray about it. And uh, one morning, one night, the thing burned down, burned to the ground. And so one lady got up and she looked out the window and she was so excited because that thing was gone. Uh, there was nothing left, but it was down to the, nothing left. So she came running down to her neighbor's house. She burst in the front door and said, hey, hey, guess what, guess what? This other one just sitting there rocking back and forth. And she said, uh, the, the tavern burned down. She said, I know it. She said, well, aren't you excited? Yeah. Well, why aren't you, I, I feel like shouting hallelujah and everything. She said, well, I think it's nice. She said, well, how did you know about it? I said, have you looked out there? She said, no. So how did you know it? She said, well, last night I got to praying about that thing. And after I got through, I decided to put feet to my prayers, and I carried a five-gallon can of kerosene down there. <laughs> and I set fire to it, and I haven't worried about it since. I've just been sitting here singing Amazing Grace ever since. <laughs> well, I don't know whether that's the best way to do or not, but that's kind of the way Asa did. He went out and just literally tore up the devil's playhouse. And... Um, Then he, uh, and when he got through with that, he didn't just tear down their worship places, close them down. He commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers and do the law and the commandment. He said, straighten up and fly right. And he took out of the cities of Judah the high places and the images and the kingdom was quiet before it. He went through and got all their idol worshiping stuff, piled it up and burned it, and broke it all to pieces and burned up what would burn. And the kingdom was quiet, I imagine so. And he built fenced cities in Judah, for the land, and the land had rest. 
And he had no war for those years because the Lord had given him rest. See, the Lord blesses when there's a real revival and a destruction of the evil. Therefore he said to Judah, let us build these cities and let us make about them walls, towers, gates, and bars while the land is yet before us because we've sought the Lord our God. We've sought him and he's given us rest on every side. So they built and prospered. They had time to build. They had time to live. They had time to prosper because they weren't at war. They'd been at war almost continually for years. The land had been in a total uproar. Now there's peace in the land. So Asa had an army of men that bear targets and spears out of Judah, 300,000. That's a pretty good sized army, isn't it? 300,000 men. That's the spearmen. And out of Benjamin that bear shields and drew bows, 204 score thousand, 280,000. So he's got over a half million men that are doing target practice. Half million uh, army man, uh, million man army is not too anything to sneeze out even today, is it? Half million men, that's quite a few. And then he had 204 score thousand. All of these were mighty men of valor. These were all tried and true soldiers. They were not little panty waist. They were not just recruits. These were men that had proven themselves in battle. He had over a half million men as soldiers, and God gave them rest. They built the cities, and they began to uh, enjoy their prosperity and their peace. Then there came out against them Zerah the Ethiopian with a host of a thousand thousand. How many is that? Hmm? Well, that wipes you out, doesn't it? Now, you go up to a million people, you, you got him, he's, he's almost two to one. Here they come. A thousand times a thousand. He raked up quite an army too. Can you imagine what that army looked like coming through the desert? A million men, here they come from Ethiopia. They came unto Marish. Asa went out against him. They set in battle array in the valley of Zep Zepatha at Marisha. Joe, come up here and pronounce these words for me. Read. <laughs> and uh, Asa cried unto the Lord, his God, and said, Lord, it is nothing with thee to help, whether there are many are with them that have no power. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rest on thee, and in thy name we go out against this multitude. O Lord, thou art our God, let, us, let not man prevail against thee. Now remember, he's outnumbered almost two to one, and he goes into battle. This is, what it ha this is why it helps to have a godly leader. What's his battle cry? He said, Lord, it doesn't matter with you whether there's a whole lot or whether there's a few. We're outnumbered two to one. That doesn't really make any difference. The odds haven't got anything to do with what's going to happen. He said, it doesn't matter to you whether there's a lot or a, lot or a few, or you don't, it doesn't matter whether they're real powerful or whether they're weak. And he said, we rest on thee. And in thy name, we go against this multitude. Uh-oh. They've got the name of the Lord over their banners. And O Lord, thou art our God. Let not man prevail against thee. Now, if you want help from God, you get on his side. Quit trying to get him on your side. A lot of people's troubles is caused, are caused when they attempt to get God to get on their side. Come on, God, get on my side. Well, I've got news for you. God is not moving. He's right where he always was, right in the middle of the right way. You know, that's like a, um, well, it's kind of like a, a, did you ever see one of these big steam locomotives or diesel locomotives? They weigh, I've forgotten, a million pounds or something like that. After I heard that, I went over and watched one go by. You know, it mashed those tracks down. I didn't ever stick my foot under there to see. But I remember when we were kids, we'd race when we were going on our bicycles to school, we'd race to get to the railroad track, and we'd put a penny on the track when the train came by because it made a nice flat. I'll tell you one thing, you didn't spend that penny after that. It was flat. 
I don't know how much it weighed, but it weighed enough to squish that penny real flat. He said, didn't put anything bigger than that? You gotta be kidding. Penny was as big as we could go those days. But anyhow, those things are heavy. Supposing you see a big diesel locomotive sitting out here in the cornfield, and it's sitting out there going toot, 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 track, come over here. Get over here on my side. Well, you know what's going to happen when it gets off track. It's not going to run. It's going to bog right up to its wheels, right? It's going to sink down because it's designed to run on track. Now, a lot of people are just like that train. They're sitting out there bogged up to the ears, and they're honking, hollering for God. Come over here, God, and get on my side. And that won't do. You've got to have God get you on his tracks if you want to run. And a lot of people are spending a lot of their time honking and whistling and tooting for God to come get on their side. You don't do that. You find out where God's side is and you get on his side and then you say, I'm with you, Lord. Don't you remember that prayer that we have in the Mass Deliverance? I declare Satan and his demons to be my enemies. See, once you declare that they're the enemies and I'm on the Lord's side, then you can turn around and say, now, Lord... <laughs> I'm with you, and they bothering me. I'm on your side. And that's when God moves. That's when he'll take up the fight. It's when you get on his side. And to quit, just wait, you're wasting time trying to get God on your side. To get God in your business, you get yourself in the right track, and God will put your business, and he'll straighten it out. Get all the kinks and lying and everything else out of you so he can have something to do with it. Otherwise, he won't touch it with a 10-foot pole. Now, this is what Asa did, and he calls on the Lord now. He said, Lord, it doesn't really matter whether it's a bunch or a few. It doesn't matter whether they're powerful or weak. This doesn't make any difference to you, and our eyes are on you. It reminds me of old um, Jehoshaphat. He, he um, prayed the same, same way almost. O oh Lord, thou art our God, let not man prevail against thee. So the Lord... Watch, the Lord smote the Ethiopians before Asa, before Judah, and they fled. A million-man army fled before an army just a little over half that size. Asa and the people with him pursued them to Gerar. The Ethiopians were overthrown. They could not recover themselves, for they were destroyed before the Lord and before his host, and they carried away much spoil, spoil, and they smote all the cities around about Gerar, for the fear of the Lord came on them, and they spoiled all the cities, exceeding much spoil in them. They smote also the tents of cattle, carried away sheep, camels in abundance, returned to Jerusalem. They came back, and they not only defeated the enemy, but they came back loaded with wealth, with livestock, with silver and gold and other things. They came away loaded with everything. God gave them the victory and paid the war debt so they didn't have to have any taxes. No income tax. How about that? You say, oh, that sounds like a time to live. Well, I don't know. You might have been as stupid as some of the people lived back there that didn't get in on this. The Spirit of the Lord comes upon Azariah, the son of Oded, and he went out to meet Asa. They're coming back now from the war. They're successful, had a successful campaign. They had just whipped the Ethiopians. And here the prophet comes out to see Asa. Hear me, hear you me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while you be with him. If you seek him, he will be found of you. If you forsake him, what? He'll forsake you. Now, what he's saying is this. The reason you're successful is because you sought the Lord. As long as you seek the Lord, you'll succeed. If you forsake the Lord, then he'll forsake you. You'll begin to be in defeat again. You're going to swell in defeat. That's why you sink in complete defeat. See, people start out, they start winning, and they say, oh, good, now I can go back and do my thing again. And then they start failing, say, so, well, it didn't work. Yes, it did. You just tried to work God, and it won't work. God's no fool. He's got a bunch of fools in his bunch, but he's not a fool. The fools in his bunch think they can work God and fool God, and it won't work. You can't, you can't fake it with God. God knows your heart. He knows why you're doing it. And a lot of people, you know, they, they raise up a bunch of buzzards. Of course, they're little baby buzzards when they leave the nest. 
and they go fluttering away. And, and then when they come back, though, they're great big grown ones, and they stink. And they're great big nasty buzzards, and they come flying back to get in the nest, and people out there saying, get away, shoo, shoo, you don't belong here. And those birds know where they roost, they're coming home to roost. You raise up a crop of sparrows, send them out, they come back buzzards. Be careful what you raise and send out. And a lot of people, you know, they'll sow a crop of wild oats. They'll go out there and rob, cheat, steal, get into immorality and everything else. Then they run down to church and pray for a crop failure. That won't work either. There's a sure reaping and sowing law that's in effect. Now these people are told squarely, you've won because you chose the Lord. As long as you choose the Lord, the Lord will choose you. You forsake him, and he'll back out from under you and let you fold up. Now, for a long season, Israel had been without the true God and without a teaching priest and without law. They'd been a long time under lawlessness and under demonic control. And they needed deliverance, right? And when they, uh, in their trouble, did turn to the Lord God of Israel and sought him, he was found of them. Isn't that encouraging? Now remember, they'd been without a teaching priest, they'd been, they had been without the law, they had had no guidance whatever, but when they seek the Lord, what happens? They turn and seek the Lord, and he is found of them. So if you don't find the Lord, it's because you're not looking hard. Just quit blaming God, quit blaming everybody else. You start looking and you bump right into him because the Bible is quite explicit that when you really seek the Lord, you'll find him. The trouble is a lot of people are seeking other people and they're seeking somebody to blame their foolishness and their stupidity on and that won't work. There's some people who cannot admit that they're wrong. They always look around and say, well, it's really your fault. It hadn't been for you. And a lot of times that person had nothing whatsoever to do with their trouble. Just quit blaming other people and say, Lord, I am an ignorant, silly, stupid goose. I am responsible for about 99 and 44, 100% of my trouble. And I'm going to quit blaming my wife, quit blaming my husband, quit blaming my children, quit blaming my job, quit blaming my lack of a job. I'm just going to start saying, Lord, I am stupid. I am ignorant. I have acted like an ignorant north end of a horse going south. And I realize this, and from now on, I'm not going to be like that. I'm just admitting it. Now, when you get to that place, you'll get in touch with the Lord. Because God will get in touch with you. Now, in those times, there was no peace to him that went out, nor to him that came in, but great vexation on all the inhabitants of the countries. And the nation, nation was destroyed of nations, city of cities, for God did vex them with adversity. Now, the thing is, when people were not seeking the Lord, their land was filled with confusion, with vexation, and with adversity. And Asa and his country have a little island of peace right in the middle of all these other countries that are in turmoil. And that's a valuable lesson to learn. You can have an island of peace where you're living. If you get enough people in a nation, they can swing a nation around. You say, well, I don't know whether we got enough. Well, I doubt it too, but, uh, and I don't know whether you can swing a whole city maybe, but you know, you can start with yourself. You make a little island of yourself and get yourself lined up with God and then encourage and help your family to get lined up. You can have a family lined up and you can certainly target the church to be lined up. And uh, when you get the, enough people in the church, lined up with God, you're going to have an island of peace where you can come and receive help. Now that's why the devil fights constantly to keep the church in turmoil because he doesn't want people to have any place to go to where they can kind of anchor in a safe harbor and get out of the waves for a while and have time to think and praise the Lord. Now he's told to be strong therefore Asa let not your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. That reminds me of something Paul said. He said, you'll reap in due season if you 
Faint not. There are a lot of people who work very hard to get something done. They sacrifice, they go, and they dedicate themselves. And then they get all frustrated and upset because the hardness of the way. As the scripture over there said, many were discouraged in the Old Testament. Many were discouraged because of the hardness of the way. And many people throw up the hands and quit just when they're on the verge of winning. On the plains of hesitation bleached the bones of millions who at the dawn of victory sat down to rest and while resting died. Wouldn't it be terrible if you got right up to the edge of the victory you'd been working for all your life and then you got all discouraged and sat down and said, well, I think I'll just sit here and die. And then when you get dead, the Lord will say, look, just over the hill there, you were almost there when you quit. You could have enjoyed the victory. It was already in your grasp. You just had to go a little bit further. Of course, some people don't get that far because they... They have a rather short fuse, and if it doesn't happen today or next week or at the end of next month, forget it. I know it took 30 years to get the mess it's in, but it ought to get straightened out quicker than that because I've become aware of the problem. Once I'm aware of the problem, then God's obligated to straighten it out immediately. I want it straightened out yesterday. I will settle for today at the very latest next week. Now, you just can't come and lay it on God like that. It's not going to work. He is not going to be influenced by that. He's not even upset by it. He just looks at you and thinks, well, there's another poor, foolish creature. Hadn't learned anything yet. Still in their stupidity. The marvel is that he still loves us. I have trouble loving people that have done a lot less than that to me, don't you? Now, you look guilty anyway. You don't look like you're very loving at times. But look what we've done to God. My word, and he still just hangs on. His love just keeps hanging in there. Well, uh, Asa listens. Notice he heard the words in the prophecy of Oded the prophet, and he took courage. A prophecy is able to give courage. That's why a lot of these prophecies are nothing but hot air they're not even worth the air they take up because a real prophecy causes those who listen to take courage and he took courage what did he do he put away the abominable idols out of all the land of Judah and Benjamin out of the cities which he'd taken from Mount Ephraim and renewed the altar of the Lord that was before the porch of the Lord he went back over and found a few of those idols he hadn't gotten on the first sweep it caused him to buckle down and do even better. God had blessed him and had given his army victory and great wealth from the spoils of the war. And because the prophet came and encouraged his heart, he immediately went about doing the same thing that had brought victory in the first place. So many times people slack off and say, well, now I've got God going my way. Now I can just kind of slack off, you know, no way. You keep going on the path that brought victory in the first place. That's the idea. He gathered all Judah, verse 9, and Benjamin and the strangers with them out of Ephraim and Manasseh and out of Simeon, for they fell to him out of Israel in abundance when they saw the Lord his God is with him. Look at the people coming out of these other three tribes, Ephraim, Manasseh, and Simeon. Out of these three tribes, people began to desert and came over there. Boy, I bet that made them mad. He's proselyting our flock. Our members are going over there and joining his. Well, they'll have something the people want, want to get affiliated with. It doesn't bother me when uh, they uh, open up a new mushroom tabernacle nearby and it draws all the fluff and duff over there. Fills it up with the dancing jitterbug and crowd. I figure that's skimming off the trash. Just to put it plain, just flatly, you know, I mean, just skimming off those that hadn't got anything to them anyway. If that's what they want, let them go. That's why we continue to have the open door policy. If you don't like it here, goodbye. 
I got word this week about somebody running around saying there's 15 witches in that Hegwish church, those women out there. Well, that put, put her, wipes you gals out. It's a good thing that gal's not pastor, isn't it? I plan to tell her that, probably Sunday. I don't see her tonight. I'll get around to it. You can believe that. And if she doesn't cease and desist immediately, if not sooner, I'll first come check and see if it's so. And if it is, then I'm going to say you have one of two choices. You may walk out of the church now, or you may get up and make a public apology. You are not the pastor of the church, and I'm quite sure there are enough capable people around here to pick up the fact that if there were any real active witches around here. Just because somebody's got your number doesn't make them a witch. See, you start fooling with the flock, you've tangled with the shepherd, whether you know it or not. I'm very peace-loving ordinarily, but if you fool with the flock, you've got me to answer to. And I can give you a better interrogation than the contra hearings, I'll guarantee you that. <laughs> you're fooling around the sheep, just don't fool with the sheep. People are welcome to come here, I don't mind them coming. But they better keep their mouth shut and criticism or we'll tell them that the door is now closed. This is not uh, for you. You go to the place you like. You don't like it here, goodbye. You say, would you tell them that? I sure would. How many I believe I'd tell them that? Yeah, some of you have been here. I've told them that publicly before. I'll tell them I can do it publicly or privately. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't embarrass me. They may be embarrassed, but I won't. I tell them like I told that little bunch of school kids I got one time. I inherited a fifth grade bunch that came into the sixth grade. Their little first year teacher, just fresh out of college, they nearly drove her to a nervous breakdown the year before. They like to run her out of her cotton picking mind. Now, you don't grin. They had some kids like yours. That's what did it. Well, they came into sixth grade all prime. They'd fixed that little old teacher up. Well, they told me about it. I announced the first day, I said, I understand you almost drove your teacher to a nervous breakdown last year. And oh, there was a lot of tittering. <laughs> I said, this year, I can guarantee you one thing, I will not have a nervous breakdown. You may, but I won't. And we established who was who, and we didn't have any problems. I don't even remember being nervous. I saw a bunch of kids that were nervous. And I made them even more nervous when they got out of our order. Some things you don't have to put up with. So these people came and joined when they saw that the Lord was in the midst of Judah and Benjamin. Benjamin, people from Ephraim, Manasseh, and out of Simeon came, gathered themselves together at Jerusalem in the third month, verse 10, in the 15th year of the reign of Asa, and they offered to the Lord the same time of the spoil which they brought, 700 oxen, 7,000 sheep. And they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart, with all their soul. You see, when one segment of God's people got straightened out, threw out all the trash and began to serve God, it inspired others to come and make themselves a fresh dedication to the Lord, and they pledge themselves to follow the Lord. It does pay to serve the Lord. It gives hope to others who are out there in the world, but who have a desire to serve God. And they entered into a covenant to seek God, the Lord God, their fathers, verse 12, with all their heart, with all their soul, and that whosoever would not seek the Lord God of Israel should be put to death. Well, that fixes it so if you're not here with them, you won't be long. They have a lot of funerals, and that clears out all the opposition. Whether small or great, man or woman. And they swear unto the Lord with a loud voice, with shouting, with trumpets, and with cornets. And all Judah rejoiced at the oath, for they had sworn with all their heart and sought him with their whole desire. And he was found of them, and the Lord gave them land, rest, uh, gave them rest round about. In other words, they were thrilled because other people were seeing the sensibility of surrender to the Lord. Also concerning Micah, the mother of Asa the king, 
He removed her from being queen because she'd made an idol in a grove. Asa cut down her idol, stamped it, and burned it at the brook. Mama ran off and got, fixed herself a little old idol. Her son found it. He cut it down, chopped it up, burned it up, stamped it in the ground. Said, Mama, we're not having none even for you. I'm not making an exception. You get rid of this mess. So he made Mama come around. But the high places were not taken away out of Israel. Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was perfect all his days. There were a few high places over in Israel, in the land of Simeon, Ephraim, Manasseh, that didn't get cut out. And he brought into the house of the Lord the things that his father had dedicated, that he himself had dedicated, silver, gold, and vessels. There was no more war for the 35-year reign of Asa. Now I want to ask you something. Is it worthwhile to have the right kind of leadership? See, the warfare on the outside ceased. They still had warfare in the land. They were busy cleaning up the demonic mess. And I think this is true. Once you get peace settled and people's hearts bound to the Lord, then you go to work to clean up the mess that the devil and his crowd has left behind. And that's what we've got to do now. We've made peace with the Lord through the Lord Jesus Christ, but we have demonic garbage to clear up. You didn't see how I was going to fit deliverance into that, did you? We have a lot of things left to go. There are idols in our hearts and our lives that still have to go. There are groves that have to be mowed down if we're really going to be committed to the Lord like he wants us to be. And the more committed we are to the Lord, the more the peace of God is going to garrison our hearts and minds. And then we're told in the New Testament about this peace that passeth understanding. Now that peace comes, that rest comes, when you have done everything that you know is right. When you've done all that you know to do is right. And you quit defending yourself, you've quit making excuses, and you've accepted your part of whatever the blame might be for something. And you've just said, okay, Lord, I've done, now this is the way it is, this is the best I know how to do, and this is what I'm going to do. And when you do that, you're going to bring great peace to yourself. And once you have that, it'll communicate to those in your household. And don't knock it till you've tried it. You can live in the midst of a storm and have peace inside. A lot of people, you see, they never get past fighting the storm that's on the outside. And we're going to be fighting a storm on the outside as long as we live. And the more successful you are inside, the more successful you'll be on the outside fighting that storm. And remember this. A storm can beat on the outside of your house, and the rain can pour down. But it can be very quiet and cozy in your house. And if you have some leaks, what do you do? Well, you don't go out there and take an ax and knock some holes in the roof and say, I'll fix you just a little teeny leak. I'll give you, I'll give you something big to leak through. And then you have a big bunk, bucket full of pouring through. That's not the way you fix a leak, is it? No, you go after those leaks. You find out where the water's coming from, and you, you attend to it. If you've got good sense, of course, if you're kind of ignorant, well, you might take an ax and try to knock a hole, chop a hole, see if that would stop the leak. But it doesn't take too much sense to find out that's not the way you patch a roof. That's not the way you stop the air coming in around the windows. And you will learn that you're going to have to live in an atmosphere of a storm around you as long as, you, as long as you're on this earth. It's never going to be quiet and peaceful. It'll be relatively quiet and peaceful. And you'll have seasons of time when you'll be, it'll be so quiet it'll be frightening. You'll wonder, what's he up to now? Now what is the enemy planning? You know, It's been too quiet, it's been too peaceful. But in the meanwhile, you'll enjoy the quietness and the peace that you have. So just know that the devil is always moving, but God's always moving too. And the more you come to a balance on the inside, the more you're going to be able to balance what's going on the outside. And you can, the way you can tell you're making headway is that you don't fly apart every time you hit a problem. And another way you can tell is that when you do fly apart, you get deeply convicted for it. That's progress, too. Whereas before, you could brush it off and say, well, it's really, really your fault. You made me do it. 
therefore I'm justified. Hmm? When you get to the place where you can say, it was really my fault, and I'm sorry, you're making headway. You're coming out of that mess, out of that bondage of trying to justify yourself constantly. You're coming out of there to where you can have more and more peace on the inside. That's worthwhile. Don't ever kid yourself, it's not worthwhile to have the peace of God moving around, working around inside your heart. We all need it. We all hunger for it. And most of us do things that cause just the opposite. We read, you know, a soft answer turneth away wrath. So when Mama comes in and says, where'd you put that? Well, don't yell at me. I didn't put it anywhere. Well, what are you yelling at me about? Does that sound familiar? You never heard anything like that around your place, did you? Try a soft answer and see what happens. See, if you try the soft answer, you put the shoe on somebody else's foot. You say, I'm not going to do it. They had no business snapping at me like that. Try a soft answer and see what happens. That person will begin to see, ooh, I was kind of ugly. And they'll throttle back. Where'd you put that? I don't know. You did the stupid thing again, huh? That's guaranteed to cause a fight, right? Because immediately she says, well, you don't win any prizes, big boy, you know, for the, what you did last week or yesterday, you know. You seen my keys? Have you lost them again? These are the little things some of you look so guilty out there. I don't know. Nobody gave me any notes. Nobody. <laughs> Aren't these the places where the little irritations show up, you know? How do you like the food? <laughs> I guess it's all right. And you better say it's good. <laughs> she might serve it on your head the next time, you know. Keep in mind, Tomaine is not too far away. A touch of Tomaine will put you back in line. Little, little Rigamartus had stopped that complaining. <laughs> we know all these principles, but it's so hard to keep them in mind. Because, you know, we're so good and the other people are so terrible, aren't they? Honey, I wish you'd pick up your clothes. What do you think I married you for? <laughs> oh, boy, that's good for an hour. That's good for a real Lulu. Hmm? Well, I could go on, but I think you're beginning to get the point. Let's start putting our Bible principles, let's start asking the Lord to put a watch before our lips. There's a scripture. You say, where is it? I'm going to make you look it up. You say, you don't know where it is. You don't know that for sure. But it's in there. Set a watch, O Lord, upon my mouth, before my lips. And you'd be surprised what you'll nearly choke to death for a while because you won't be able to say half what you start to say. You'll start, <clears throat> and that angel will say, swallow it, swallow it. <clears throat> and you'll say, ooh, that's right. Bitter words don't taste good when you swallow them. Don't spit them out on somebody else. But if we'll start working on these little areas of our life, it can make a big difference in areas of our life. Don't you think so? Wouldn't it be worth trying? Especially in the hot weather when everybody, mm, 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 mm. when it's good to come to church just to cool off. Amen. You say, well, I come in here to cool off, then you heat me up again. <laughs> well, I hope so. You are allowed to stay a reasonable length of time and cool back off again. Asa was an obedient leader. 
We need to pray for leaders. In the lead. I know it sounds impossible. And I think about it sometimes. I think, Lord, it'll never work. And then God says, there is nothing impossible with me. And I said, oh, yeah, that's right. So we're going to have to pray for leaders who will not give up, but will stand for the right and do what's right. I believe that if we'll continue to pray for this, just keep praying for leaders at all levels. Do you believe God's able to do that? Do you believe he's able to forge some? You say, well, some of them, they're in charge. They're so bad. I know. I thought about that too. And I thought about Nebuchadnezzar, who was ruler of the universe at the time he lived. I mean, he was the biggest honcho on the earth. And you know something? That boy got high and lifted up and got all drunk on his own, how great he was. And God made him rip off all his clothes, crawl around on his hind, on his all fours for seven years and eat grass. He grew out fingernails that were like claws of an eagle and toenails. And he ate straw like an ox for seven years while he learned huma humility. I thought, well, I guess if God was big enough to take him on, he could take on some of these other boys. I'm watching to see if anybody's fingernails start growing, you know. I believe we need to take hope and pray. Because it, would it be worth it? It'll bring peace to the land. If it brings peace, now you see it didn't bring peace to all of the, ten, the 12 tribes. It only brought peace to the ones in the south and to those who were nearby who came over and joined them. But it's worthwhile to have peace where you live, isn't it? So let's start out with ourselves. Let's branch out to our families, to our church. And then from there, we'll keep reaching out and hopefully enlist others to do the same thing. Do you think the weapons of our warfare will work? They're not carnal, they're spiritual. To the pulling down of strongholds. Are there any strongholds you can think of need pulling down? You say, yeah, I worked on that for a while and then I got discouraged and quit. Maybe that's why the strongholds are still holding. Maybe we need to buckle down and try again. If you've never asked Jesus in your heart or you're not sure you have, wouldn't you like to tonight? He said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. If you've never done this or you're not sure you have, wouldn't you like to? He said, if you'll just ask him to come in your heart, Lord Jesus, if I've never really asked you in my heart, I'm asking you now. Come into my heart. Save me from all my sin. Get it settled. If you can't get it settled where you sit, come down to the front and tell the people up front here, I need to talk to somebody about salvation. That's all you need to say. If that's not your problem, but you're driven, harassed, tormented, this is producing compulsive behavior, which slows down, stops, reverses spiritual growth and progress. You're talking about the work of demons, and they need to be cast out in Jesus' name. These signs follow them that believe my name, so they cast out devils, speak with new tongues, lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. We believe in the whole thing. If you have needs in any of these areas, then by all means come. And the church is going to go to ministry now. It becomes a body ministry from here, and the people will be ministering. Let's stand and sing something about that name. As we do, if you have a need, you come and let the people minister to you in Jesus' name.